coming soon. Okay. Speaking of the ESP32 C6, we have an ESP32 C6 Feather coming soon. Eh, a couple of little things I might want to change around it, but it's pretty much good to go. Uh, so if you want to pick up this board that will be ready to use with Matter, uh, sign up. We're taking sign-ups. I don't know exactly when's going to be in the shop when it's ready, um, but uh, sign up. It'll also let me know how many to manufacture for that first run. Next up. Okay, we've got from... Um, Elect, Elect makes, oh man, I forgot their name. We have the Microbit Retro Arcade. This is for your Microbit V2, which has the NR52 series. Does not work with the original, sorry, Elect Freaks. Thank you. Not Elect makes. Elect Freaks Retro Programming Arcade with the NR52 on the V2 Microbit, the new version. You can run MakeCode Arcade on it. We love MakeCode Arcade. Uh, the only thing is, is that a microbit does not have a display. It doesn't have enough buttons to do like arcade games. Um, this is a beautifully designed little shield. Even it got a battery pack, so it's nice and safe. Doesn't use rechargeable batteries. You plug the microbit into the top, and you get your 180 by 160 color display. You get six buttons. You get Jack DAC, which is their plug and play system for adding sensors. It's got this nice curved round hand holdable thing. And uh, the alligator clips are duplicated on the bottom, so you can um, cool. quickly add sensors. I don't know. I thought it was a really cute design. But yeah, like a lot of people have microbit V2s. But just I want to say it again. You need the V2. Will not work with the V1. The V1 is too slow to run MakeCode Arcade. Next up. Okay. Next up, uh, we got the Vivid Unit in. This is from UU Gear. Uh, we stock a bunch of their Raspberry Pi stuff. This is not Raspberry Pi based. It's actually a rock chip um micro uh, microcomputer on the back but it does have a pi compatible ish pin out so let's look at the back this is jam-packed and by the way i'm going to forget some of the things that are on this board it's got the rock chip uh 3399 core processor it's got a built-in speaker it's got two usb three ports it's got headphone out it's got speaker it's got um ssd ssd M2 NVMe built in, so you don't need a separate NVMe thing. HDMI, uh, camera connector, uh, looks like analog input, uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, onboard microphone, onboard RTC battery connector, um, your gigantic power supply. Look at that huge inductor in there. So there's the power supply. Um, Ethernet and uh, the 2 by 20 connector. And then, of course, on the front, beautiful uh i think it's 800 by 480 color pixel display so i think this is you know it's really cool what's neat is you can tell it's a tablet display um that they've kind of recycled but like it's cool uh so this is just it showing i mean it's gonna be tough to see because it's a tft um but it's a uh full capacitive touch screen display um so you can like open up app applications you can open oh, speedy speedy operating system yeah it's very speedy i'll say i you know i, I don't think i set up wi-fi on this yet um but it's got you know all this stuff built in so it's kind of like i don't want to say it's like a raspberry pi but it's the same similar kind of idea of a microcomputer but it's got a display ready to go so you can like easily mount this or use it uh with projects and it's running linux so of course you could install Python on it. You can run Python on hardware. Um, you can uh, communicate GPIO. You can control I squared C sensors. You can do quite a bit. It's like a you know a powerful all in one microcomputer basically that runs Linux. So I think it's interesting. It's definitely going to be more expensive than just a Raspberry Pi because it's got all that stuff built in. But like you know you got a capacitive touch display um, and all the Ethernet and the Wi Fi and the USB and the built in speakers and the built built in NVMe. I think if you added up what it would cost to put this all together on something like a Pi, it would be more expensive. So if you are using all that stuff, this is good to go. And I like that it like boots immediately. You don't have to like burn an SD card or anything. It's got um, onboard memory, I guess, to be honest. I don't know how much. Look at the specs because I, I don't have it memorized. Um, yeah, and it's in the shop. We have a couple. If people like it, we'll stock more. Thanks, up. Next up, this is an update to the MHP30. It's an MHP50. Uh, which is a hot plate that you can use to do rework or reheating of um, small mic small uh, electronic boards. I'll say this came in today. I didn't get to grab one, otherwise I would show it off live. If you remember the MHP30, um, that's the reheat plate that I've been using. It's three centimeter by three centimeter. This is five by five, so it's like twice as much. Also, it can use DC or USB 
PV power. It's 100 watts over USB, 150 watts max over DC power. So it heats up very quickly. Um, but you do need to get an external like laptop-ish USB PD power supply. Also, the OLED's been updated to use a color TFT. I think I'm going to definitely pick one up when we go yeah. you know, by the shop um, tomorrow. Because if you have a, you know, I had, I've had a larger board, like a feather board. I've had to kind of shove it around a little bit to make it fit uh, on the MHP30. But the 50 is basically the same price um, and bigger. But you need a better power supply. That's the thing. So if you're using DC power, you're going to need a 24 volt power supply that can do uh, five plus amps. And if you're using USB PD, you need a laptop power supply that can do 100 watts. All right. Next up. Next up, we have an RJ12 panel mount extension cable. This looks like Ethernet, but it's not. It's RJ12, also sometimes called RJ11, if it only has the four cables. This is for telephony projects. So if you're using telephone cable, uh, which is a six contact cable, RJ11, RJ12, uh, this will definitely work well for you because you can panel mount it. Uh, what, I nice about, what I like about these round panel mount um, cables is you don't have to cut a square hole or like a weird oval hole and have drills. You just cut one 30 millimeter round hole and up to, I think, a quarter inch or half inch material. Um, you screw the, um, the nut off the back. There is this, you can see at the bottom, yeah. there's a, there's a lug nut, whatever, it's a protection nut. Uh, put the cable to the hole, put the nut on the back, screw it in and you're golden. And the lip covers up any like imperfections in the hole too. So this is kind of my favorite um, way of making panel mount connectors. So if you're using telephony cables, this is the way to go. All right, I'm getting close to the start of the show. Not yet, very close. Okay, uh, the ADG 728. This is an I2C one to eight analog switch. So I think we had an analog switch a while ago that was like one to two. You could like have the switch go like normally open, normally close like a relay. This is kind of an interesting chip from analog devices, but it's like, you know, it's hard to get I2C controllable analog switches. And so I thought this was worth stocking. So um, if you look at the front, at the top, there's eight pins labeled S1 through S8. And at the bottom, at the bottom right, there's a pin labeled D. So the D pin can be connected to any of the S1 through S8 pins. But here's the thing, it's not like a multiplexer selector. You can connect multiple pins to the D pin. So you, it's like a ma it's a matrix. You can actually connect, con connect like S8 to S3 to D or S1 through S4 to D, or all pins connect together. So you can actually use it for merging signals, not just for selecting a signal. Although I think a lot of people use it for selecting a signal. You write the switches you want on via I squared C. It's break before make, so you don't have to worry about things accidentally getting connected if you set all the pins at once. You basically just write the eight bit value and the, that whatever is a one, it gets connected, whatever is a zero, it's not. There's two address pins to change the address and a reset if you want to like immediately set all the pins to be open. So, you know, what would this be used for? Um, this isn't good for anything over five volts because it has to be, the analog signal has to be less than, has to be greater than ground and less than the VN. So it's good for like up to three or five volt signals. So they're definitely good for analog, um, so analog audio signals because those are gonna be like less than a volt. If you wanna move around audio signals, this is definitely gonna be the way to go. You don't get any clicking like you would with um, a relay. And of course it's instantaneous. Um, also could be used for some video signals, could be used for signals into a DAC. Um, I've seen, you know, these kinds of switches used for the inputs into, um, you know, op amps, if you want to move signals around. Uh, so this is very, you know, there's a lot of pins available, eight to one, but basically this is kind of what was available. The only other thing we had was a one way switch. This is a one to eight switch. All right, and the story starts tonight besides you, lady, our team, our customers, everybody who makes this thing go is? The ADG729, which is the sister of the ADG728. Very similar, but a little bit different. So the ADG728 had one to eight switch. This has one to four switch twice. So two switches, so two sets of switches. So you see at the top, there's one A through four A and then one B through four B. And at the bottom right, there is there is the DA and DB pin. So you can select any of the ACE pins to collect to the DA pin and any of the B pins, any of the four B pins to the DB pin. 
So basically it's good for stereo analog signal switching. So good for audio, especially if you have, you know, stereo signals and you want to move them around. It can also be used for video or like, you know, sensor reading or whatever. Um, and then don't forget, it's not a selector. You can connect multiple pins to the switch. Like each one has an individual switch. So you can have all the switches on. And that means there's four pins connected to the D, A or DB pin. Um, so that'd be good if you wanted to merge uh, signals together, which you can do with this analog switch. And then of course it's bi-directional too. It's not like one way. It's not like, oh, the signal only goes from DA to 4B or whatever, or 4A. It's bi-directional. It's a full analog. Like it looks like a transparent 2.5 ohm connection between the switched pins and the DA or the DB pin. It's also, um, it's controllable over I squared C. So like the 728, you write uh, 8 bit value and that tells it which switches you want to have on. You can have all of them on, all of them on, some of them on. And then two address pins. Um, and the only thing it's missing compared to the 728 is the reset pin. There's no reset pin because instead you have, you know, the two DA and DB pins. So that's, that's what got dropped in order to uh, have the dual one to four switch. So both are, you know, very similar and they use very similar code, but one is a dual one to four and one is a single one to eight analog switch. Awesome. Both useful. That's right.